It's one thing to listen to doom and gloom about food and fertilizer shortages, skyrocketing prices, the cost of living, or your job being outsourced overseas or eliminated due to automation. It's quite another thing to hear practical, immediately actionable advice from experts who can help you reduce the fear, anxiety, and burden of these problems. Tune in now to the Surviving Hard Times podcast from the Finding Genius Foundation with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Surviving Hard Times podcast. I have uh, Ashley Essigan. She has a Bachelor of Science in Soil Science, and she's the founder of uh, Gardening in Canada. So if you go to YouTube, you put in Gardening in Canada, and you'll find her channel. So Ashley, thanks for coming. Yeah, anytime. No problem. Well, if you would tell me a bit about your background and how you got into gardening. And I'm sure Canada is not a, an easy place to do it because of the weather. But, you know, what's your background? That's fair. So my background actually is in soil science and my profession is in agriculture. So that's kind of where it all started for me. I've gardened and kept houseplants my entire life. Pandemic hit. And of course, everyone started gardening and keeping houseplants. And I was the go-to contact for pretty much any friend and family that knew kind of how successful my garden was. So one suggestion popped up that I should make some resources for people to use so I don't have to keep repeating myself, save myself some time. And then that's how Gardening in Canada was born. So. Okay. What's your channel about? What are you doing now? So I like to garden with science is kind of my basis. So of course I'm in a colder climate, which can make it a little bit more difficult typically, but the main premise is with science. So it kind of applies to anyone outside of Canada, um, anywhere in North America, I have followers, you know, in New Zealand, Australia, all over Europe. And they all say that it's relevant to what they're doing as well, because I just essentially take scientific journals that have been written by different universities and digest them into usable formats for people that are trying to grow gardens on a small scale. And a lot of the studies that I look at are meant for market gardens or for farmers, and therefore the data inside of them is geared to someone on a much larger scale. And being able to kind of translate that into someone who's on a smaller scale, like a a home gardener, is obviously useful because it can tell people kind of where they should or shouldn't put their money in regards to just cultivating a lot of this stuff. So, yeah. Uh, Do you deal with hydroponics or do you deal with uh, growing outdoors or what's the focus? So I'm all over the place. I have my garden that I have some raised beds and then I have my garden that's in ground. So obviously those are two slightly different conditions. The one that is in ground outdoors is a clay loam type soil, which is very classic to Saskatchewan and kind of classic to just anyone who is gardening in North America. A loam or a clay loam is very common. The other really common one is a sandy soil, which is kind of on the different side of the scale. But regardless, it comes with different issues. And then the other version is raised bed gardening. So obviously with that, I'm importing a lot of soil or compost, whichever, you know, is accessible to me. And then using that to ultimately grow the garden. Garden. Again, different scenario, different types of soil, different management types. And then I do, I'm so I'm starting this year only just by popular demand to actually garden in the winter or late fall, early spring. So I'm starting to get, you know, the low tunnels in place and the cold frames. And then I'm also doing my hydroponics indoors. So I have several grow tents set up. And I'm going to try some soil gardening indoors, although I do find personally, regardless of what you're growing, whether it's leafy greens or if it's um, fruits and veg, that sort of thing, they typically do do quite a bit better in hydroponics. I find it much easier to actually use indoors and it's not as intimidating as what people may think it is. It's actually pretty darn easy. So I I'd say between my more preserved crops that I do in the summertime combined with my hydroponics and then, of course, microgreens and sprouting, 
I probably grow at least 80%. Well, I grow all the fruit and veg that I need, or I forage, you know, the remaining fruit because fruit is something that's, you know, semi difficult to come across here in Canada. You, you usually have to forage for that sort of stuff, but I would say 80% of all my fruits and vegetables, anything that's just not tropical or citrus, uh, I am able to get on my own. And then other than that, it's just meat that I actually have to buy from local farmers, preferably, or in the worst case scenario, from a grocery store. So I'm pretty self-sufficient, just not having a ton of land either. I mean, I don't have anything enormous and just being able to, you know, put the right science in place to really make sure I'm maximizing the yields where possible. So. Okay. All right. And then uh, since you've, uh, you know, the bachelor's of soil science, um, have you or anyone looked at the difference between hydroponically grown and soil grown produce? You know, the same fruit, the same vegetable, whatever it is, what's the difference in nutritional content between the two growing types? Yeah, so there um, is a lot of a lot of studies going on with that sort of thing. In particular, looking at even just comparing different forms of soil nutrient uh, or micronutrient depleted soils to regular soils and that sort of thing. And um, you know, hydroponics tends to come out on top because a lot of the micronutrient profile and the nutrient profile is being supplemented through additions. And so we're actually using quite a bit of chemistry in hydroponics to determine um, what nutrients need to be, needs to be added or not added. And then ultimately, what makes hydroponics in a lot of cases more nutrient rich when it comes to fruits and veg is that it has the correct pH. So when we're adding water or fertilizer in any way, shape or form to a hydroponic system, we're usually balancing out our pH and putting it in optimal range for plant uptake. And plants have a very narrow range in which they can uptake nutrients. So when we look at the pH scale, many of us are familiar, you know, with the classic one to 14. And the reality is, is that uh, a majority of crops out there are in that 6.5 to 7 range. It's very narrow. There's some that, you know, thrive more in the acidic range and they're not, it's not like they're going to die or um, not thrive or not grow and ranges outside of that. But when it comes to optimal nutrient uptake, where we're not getting too much nitrogen, that's kind of butting out the micronutrients. We're not getting too much micronutrients, which can be affecting, you know, our fruit yield, that sort of thing. It's in that 6.5 to 7. And with hydroponics, we have the ability to perfectly adjust all our inputs so that we are taking up exactly what we need. And so because of that, you could make the argument that the plant itself that you're then eating or the fruit itself you're eating is more nutrient rich and, uh, you know, has the exact diversity you need for your body. Now, when we're growing in soil, we have depleted soils um, in a lot of places, just naturally that happens because of our soil texture, not even to do with management. So a sandier soil is going to lack more water-soluble nutrients. So micro or macronutrient that can be water-solubilized is going to, you know, be leached out of the ground much quicker. And then the opposite to that would be clay, where we could have, you know, dry spots or hard pans, all of which are going to affect our nutrient uptake. So knowing, you know, with soil, we we usually test and science is getting a lot better than what it was before. So prior to, I'd say even two years ago, a lot of our soil testing that we would do in agriculture or for farms would be just based on total nitrogen, total phosphate, total calcium. And it wouldn't be focusing much on bioavailable forms of that nutrient. So our nutrient in our soil could show that our nitrogen is rich, but the reality is, is that it's in the wrong form for nutrient uptake. And so we need to actually convert that nitrogen into a usable form. And so because of that, just because our soil tests show that we have enough nutrients doesn't necessarily mean we do. So that's kind of the other downfall to growing in soil, but obviously we live on planet earth. So when we come to convenience and cost wise, soil is the more convenient and cost efficient solution than hydro at this point. Well, what but, about um, yeah. mycorrhizae that are associated with plant roots and the earthworms and the whole microbiome of soil? You don't seem to get that with hydroponics. 
No, so you you won't get that with hydroponics. And I, I get that question quite often, actually, and people asking for if you should be adding uh, mycorrhizae or, you know, phosphate solubilizing bacteria and that sort of thing into hydroponics. And the reality is, is that there isn't much study to say that it does anything because that hyphae and those bacteria can actually colonize properly. So in a healthy soil, like a garden soil, for example, and not on a farm scale, we do have those benefits because we can implement proper moisture, you know, no-till or low-till techniques, all of which will help encourage earthworm activity and microbe activity, micro, uh, mycorrhizal, uh, the hyphae and that sort of thing moving throughout the soil. So, I mean, from that perspective, it's awesome. It's on a large scale farming. So if you're getting your produce from, you know, a grocery store, it's quite a bit different than when it's from the garden. And I'm sure your listeners and you yourself will be able to know the difference there. When you taste something from your garden, it tastes quite a bit different. And people will, you know, normally chalk that up to, well, transport times. And um, it's, you know, it's so far beyond picked. And that's the reason for the flavor difference. And the reality is, is it probably comes down to nutrient profile and soil health. That's kind of making that flavor profile a little different and ultimately it having more nutrients in it. So those microbes are huge um, for just decomposing and making a lot of nutrients bioavailable, which ultimately is what gets transplanted or I guess transcribed into your, your fruit and veg itself. So if we're talking on a garden scale, hydro for soil, soil is going to win out hands down especially if the person is putting time and focus on soil health and really trying to cultivate a microbiome rather than just treating soil as a vector to, you know, hold nutrients that we add fertilizer to and that's it. That's all. So if we're cultivating a healthy microbe environments, then yeah, for sure. It's, it's definitely. Well, what, about, what about amongst the, uh, the different hydroponic methods, you know, expanded clay pebbles versus just deep water, or nutrient, you know, thin films or a flood and drain, you know, is anyone yeah. looking to get, uh, you know, the nutrition based on the different methods of hydroponics? No, I haven't seen anything in regards to that. And I don't know if it's because, because I've looked into this a little bit, and I don't know if it has to do with what the companies themselves are using or not. So, for example, in my house, so I have deep water culture. And then I have just like a trickle system. One is using like the LECA that you're talking about. And the other one's using kind of like these little peat pods. And it's essentially just rock wool type thing. But it's just dripping water onto the rock wool pellet. And ultimately, that's how those, those fruits and vegetables are grown. There's so many different forms of that. And it's going to come down to which one's the most economical and which one the majority of hydroponic growers are currently growing to even determine, you know, what study would be worth looking at. Usually speaking, the studies I've looked at will indicate what form of hydroponics they're growing in. So they'll indicate that it's a deep water culture or they'll indicate that it's a passive or an active, like they'll say what form it is, but they'll never use that study to then compare against a different form of hydroponics. And ultimately, I I mean, when you look at aquaponics, for example, which would be fish and more of like a whole ecosystem type setup, you do tend to see more microbial activity. And and that one, I guess you could argue just because of the sheer diversity of microbes and even macrofauna in the form of, you know, fish or snails or whatever the case is that's in that system, you could end up with a more diverse form of nutrient profile. So, I mean, there is that argument there. All right. Um, so it sounds like you get a pretty extensive operation, uh, you know, with the upcoming potential food shortages People that have never gardened before, never done anything, how do you suggest they dip their toe in? Should they grow microgreens or just a few vegetables or you know, how would someone get started with no experience? Yeah, it's a good question. Just start. 
don't think about it too, too much. If you're going into, you know, the winter season here and you're in a cooler climate where you can't necessarily grow a crop in these upcoming months, I would encourage you guys to lean towards, you know, sprouts and microgreens to start with. Those ones you need very little to no light. If you choose to actually garden indoors, um, you are going to need some form of a grow light. And don't overcomplicate it and spend too much time researching this sort of thing. I just like to tell people to go with a full spectrum light and just be done with it. So there are some really fancy ones out there that have actually quite large footprints for very little money wise. Get some food safe five gallon pail buckets and get some potting soil. I like to use Sunshine Mix number five because it has very coarse perlite in it. You can do like a DIY self-watering container type setup and ultimately you're off to the races. Inside of those containers, you can grow um, and combined with the full spectrum light, you can grow herbs, you can grow uh, leafy greens, all that sort of stuff. And if you're choosing to go with fruits, so cucumbers, tomatoes, that sort of thing, I would encourage people to get a dwarf or determinate variety. So anything that says it's designed for containers, patios, um, they'll commonly say like snacker cucumbers, or it will say determinant cherry tomatoes or red robin is a really popular one. Um, these are all miniature plants that ultimately won't overcrowd your grow space, but will actually produce fruits and vegetables much quicker. And then I think the, the next thing when we're talking about food shortages or just even the cost of food, I would encourage your listeners to figure out how to actually save seeds. So right now is a great time of year to run around to your neighbors and try to collect or, you know, request some fruits and vegetables for them and then save seeds from those crops. Ultimately, those crops were grown in your conditions, meaning the seeds from those offspring are, you know, with some limitations, are going to be very well designed for your environment. And they're pretty much a fail safe that year after year, you're going to gain produce. When you order in seeds from, you know, who knows where, you do run the risk of that plant being grown in an environment that is nowhere near yours. And therefore you may end up with, you know, less produce, weaker produce, or less than stellar results, depending on the growing conditions that that plant was originally grown in. And then that those seeds were harvested from. So ultimately, you can have like your own DIY seed bank that is specifically designed for your, your environment. And so because of that, you will get better yields, quicker yields, regardless of your growing conditions. Um, if you're in a more of a tough climate, such as what I am here in zone three in Canada. Okay. So again, for new growers, there's, there are some methods that aren't too difficult where they can at least grow some vegetables through the winter and, and kind of help supplement their calories, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, root vegetables are very simple. The key here is that they just keep that soil nice and fluffy. So like I said, five gallon pail bucket with some potting soil is going to be the best bet for most people. If you want to start one outdoors, cause maybe you don't have, you know, a bit cash to start like, um, a bed or container garden or something like that, uh, get a shovel <laughs> and look up and Google something called the double dig method. And then all you're going to do is remove your lawn um, or the sod in that area. And then you're going to double dig the soil that's underneath that lawn and plant into that. You want it to be loose and fluffy up to about 18 inches in depth. And that first year that you're trying to establish a garden, I know a lot of people like to lean towards no dig and they like to lean towards Towards the compost gardens, but I would encourage people instead to actually till that first year in particular, or to double dig that first year in particular, your space up, really loosen that soil properly, and then incorporate your compost and grow into that. We're finding now, it, especially this last year, it was really, really bad, where there's almost uh, what seems to be like a persistent pesticide issue in our compost. So we're finding that a lot of plant debris and that's ending up in, you know, commercial composting scenarios is contaminated. And because of that, we end up with essentially pesticide burn. And people think that it's their 
you know, they're not able to grow or they're poor at growing. And the reality is, is that their compost is actually contaminated with a long-term or persistent herbicide is what we like to call that. And they're used on, you know, a lot of hay or forage crops. And they're meant to last in a soil system from upwards of five years or, you know, to the, you know, five-year mark typically. And so because of that, our compost in our garden ultimately can be rendered useless for a five-year period of time, usually closer to about three. But I would steer away from that. Use the soil you have at home and just really grow to tell that up, make it nice and fluffy. You know, don't stress out about the type of soil you have or anything like that. Just give it a shot, see how it works out for you, and then change things from there. Okay, um, uh, soil, I've heard sometimes if you buy soil from different stores and all that, it could have a lot of bugs in it or mushrooms in it. Have you experienced that I've heard about? Yeah, so I have had issues with this in the past. So I've had scenarios where I've had a little bit of white fungus on top of my soil or my potting soil. And that's typically from just the decomposition process. So peat or in some cases coconut coir is organic material. And so it's going to decay over time. Now it, it typically takes longer to decay than something that we would typically put in a compost, but it's going to decay. And part of that decaying process is mushrooms. And so this isn't a bad thing. And I, I encourage people not to get stressed out about it about it. If it's not blue or black and it's a white or a yellow, it's fine. It's actually a safe form of hyphae. And ultimately it's beneficial to nutrient cycling in that soil system. So whether that's a houseplant system or an outdoor system, whatever the case is, the only time I would encourage someone to sterilize their soil would be when they're starting seeds. So seed starting needs a pretty sterile environment. Because there's a number of different things that can cause a general term we call dampening off. And so dampening off is just the disease, <laughs> the, the seedlings, you know, getting kind of that rotty looking stem or just falling over at the base and no one knows why. It's just because of a bacteria or a fungus or a virus in, in the soil or in that area. And so because of that, I would pop my potting soil mix, if I was going with that, in the microwave to sterilize it. When it comes to, you know, potting up a full-size tomato or transplanting, anything like that, I actually don't get too concerned with any of those sort of things. You actually want a living ecosystem. So you want the good, you want the bad, obviously you want more good than bad, but ultimately you want that soil to be alive because the key here is that regardless if, if you're going synthetic or if you're going with organic fertilizers, you need nutrient cycling to take place. So it doesn't matter what form of fertilizer you're using. You need those microbes there to denitrify and nitrify bacteria. You need microbes there to phosphate, solubilize the, the phosphorus in your soil. You need it mobilizing all your different forms of micronutrients and delivering that to your plant roots. Because your plant roots, what they're going to do is they're going to release sugars called exudates. And those sugars are going to, you know, smell like McDonald's or cake. AFC, and they're all going to attract different types of microbes, depending on what the plant needs. If your plant sends the call out of McDonald's and no one answers, the plant is going to ultimately suffer. So we don't want fully sterile soil when it comes to planting or potting up large plants that already have a root system in place. I know for indoor gardening, we get very irritated with fungus gnats. Some people call them food flies. They're very tiny, irritating little flies. And I would actually encourage people to go with a biological control. Even if you're not trying to grow organic and you're, you don't really care, you're going to use pesticides, you're going to use synthetic fertilizers, which I don't have any problem if someone wants to go that route. They're not nearly as effective at treating an active infestation. So if we have an active infestation of thrips or in this case, or mealybugs, fungus gnats, whatever the case is, we want to use biological controls to try to remedy this. And so some of the, my favorites would be mites. You can get predatory mites that you can stick inside of your grow tent or in your plant room where you're growing your fruits and vegetables. And those will go around and they'll eat your aphids or whatever the case is. And the other side of that, from the soil perspective, nematodes is one of my favorites for being able to take out mealy, root mealies, um, fungus gnat eggs, predatory or bad 
nematode species that can cause rot in our roots, that sort of thing. So I would encourage people to go biological. These are very tiny critters. You're not going to see them crawling around your house. You won't even know they're there. I think our body, as I've heard this before, if you take a scan, a nematode scan of your body, you're literally going to see the outline of your your tissue because our entire body is just crawling with nematodes. That's how small they are. We can't see them. We don't know they're there, but they do a lot of work for us on our bodies as well as in our soil. So I would encourage people to go that route. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the biological uh, uh, pest control, I guess you said it seems to work better. What happens when the pest has eradicated the, the, the mites that you've introduced or whatever it is, or nematodes, do they then die off too? Yeah, so they do definitely need <laughs> that food source. The food source isn't present, they will die off. Um, and so depending on how many plants you have, you you know may run out of a food source sooner rather than later. And so because of that, generally speaking, if we start up an indoor garden to you know, feed ourselves through the winter, if we do a treatment on pests early on, we will eradicate any pest issues. And so long as we don't start up a new crop mid-season or we don't introduce new potting soil or a new house plant into the house, we typically won't see that issue pop up again until the outside begins to thaw and those bugs can begin to make their way into the house or if we introduce a new species or new soil into that system. So typically speaking, it's a one-time application until you decide to bring, you know, more plants into your life. And then you may want to consider to do another application in the future or simply, you know, put that plant or that soil initially into a little plant hospital somewhere else in your house, a separate room, just to make sure that it's not infected before actually placing it, you know, with the rest of your garden. Because worst case scenario is that you'd end up with a pest from an outside source that would ultimately take out your entire indoor garden, which would be absolutely devastating. So you want to watch out for that for sure. Okay. Well, very good. Yeah. You know, you've gone over a lot of concepts. Um, what's the best way for people to find out more? Should they just go to YouTube and go to gardening in Canada or is there a website? Do you have courses? Like what's next for people that listen? Yeah. So you can Google gardening in Canada and my website will pop up. It's just www.gardeningincanada.net. There's a lot of written resources there on, you know, basic steps on how to test your soil, how to reclaim your soil, um, all based in science, of course. And then there's, if you're a watcher or a listener type person, I would go um, check out the YouTube. I also have a podcast where I talk about various different concepts, but that's definitely the place to start. And if you have, you know, if your listeners have any very specific questions or quandaries, they can always reach out to me in, you know, the comment section on YouTube, send me an email, whatever the case is. And I put it, I put everyone's request on a list. And I start taking away however many requests I get. The request that's the highest gets the next video type thing. So everyone's requests do get answered eventually. And I, I take them all very seriously. There's no such thing as a dumb question. So, Okay, very good. Well, Ashley, okay. thanks so much for coming on the podcast and, and sharing all your knowledge. I appreciate you being here. Yeah, no problem. Glad, uh, glad you had me on. Before you stop listening, ask yourself, what are one or two useful things you heard on this podcast? They can help you overcome food and fertilizer shortages, skyrocketing prices, the cost of living, or your job being outsourced overseas or eliminated due to automation. Please like and subscribe and tell your friends and family about their Surviving Hard Times podcast. We're all going to need help now and in the near future.